You're listening to the Jam Price Show all about movies. And today my guest is award-winning uh, writer, director, producer, John Scheinfeld. It's good to have you back on the show, John. Nice to be back with you, Jan. Thanks. You too. I can't wait to talk about, we're going to talk about his new documentary entitled, What the Hell Happened to Blood, Sweat and Tears? Loved, loved, loved this documentary. There's so much to it. it it's, I mean, it is a, it, it it really is. It's a thriller. It's a it's about this great band. Um, you you every time you're right when you turn on, you know, when you mention blood, sweat, and tears, almost everybody can sing all the words to all their songs, and yeah. it's amazing. So let's talk about how you got how you came to this project, and let's tell the audience what it's about. <laughs> uh, absolutely. Well, it is definitely a political thriller, and it's about a band that happened to get stuck in the middle of a political rat's nest, both domestically and internationally. You don't have to be a fan of Blood, Sweat and Tears. You don't even need to know who the, who the hell Blood, Sweat and Tears are. Um, all you have to do is be interested in a compelling story that has elements of espionage, uh, politics, um, and, uh, and cancel culture before all of us knew that was a thing. Right. And they got stuck in the middle of all of this. It's just a really compelling story. So how it happened was I had met um, the leader of the band, uh, Bobby Columbi, uh, back in 2016, 17, when my Chasing Train film came out. And he loved it and wanted to take me to lunch. And we just we got acquainted. We didn't know each other uh, before and, and really hadn't stayed in touch much after. Uh, but about two months before um, COVID hit, he called me and said, I want to take you to lunch. Uh, I have a story I want to tell you. So we went to lunch and we were just sort of schmoozing about the band. And, and I asked the question, which is now the title of our film, which is what the hell happened to Blood, Sweat and Tears? Here you guys were the, one of the biggest bands going. And then you weren't. What happened? And he said, that's the story I'm going to tell you. And he started to tell me the broad outline of, of what uh, is in our film. And I thought, wow, this is, I, I hadn't heard this before. This is really compelling to me. Uh, and I, and I want to know more about it. So I kind of went out and did some due diligence. And um, I didn't find much, which was good, because that meant it was sort of fresh territory for a film. Uh, but anytime I start a new film, the question is, A, is the story compelling enough? And yes, it was in this case. And the second question I always have to ask is, are there enough audiovisual assets with which to tell this story properly. And Bobby had told me at this lunch that they had taken a documentary film crew with them on this tour behind the Iron Curtain. And it's just like, you know, my ears perked up and it's like, film, really? And uh, so I got to find this. He didn't know where the film was, hadn't really seen it. Um, nobody in the band knew where it was. So we had to mount a, a, a real, um, it's actually, Jan, one of the things I love about uh, uh, my job is the detective work. Mm -hmm. You have to really uh, um, cast a wide net and take a deep dive to try to find some of this stuff. And over the years, we found stuff in people's closets, under their beds, in their basements, in their attics, uh, whatever. Um, but in this case, what had happened was the company that paid for the documentary film crew to go along with the band uh, went uh, belly up at the end of 1970 the post-production house where they were editing the film uh, in Los Angeles went belly up in 1971. So here we are 50, 51 years later, and there's really very few people around who can say, all right, so where did it all go? They shot 65 hours of stuff and like, where did that go? And they recorded all of their concerts. Where did those tapes go? So um, we checked every independent storage facility here in LA, New York, we looked in government facilities in, in Washington, D.C., in Virginia, nothing, 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 nothing. And then one day I got a call from a woman who runs a vault here in L.A. We had reached out to her and she didn't have anything in her computerized database. But here we are, it's COVID time and she's working at home and has nothing to do one day and pulls out an old loose leaf binder. Remember those where you have actually individual pages? So this was left over from the 70s, and she found a reference to Blood, Sweat, and Tears. So the next time she was in the vault, she went and looked, and lo and behold, in a far corner of the vault, in a section of material uh, marked for destruction, she finds two pristine prints 
of a version of the footage that they shot. Oh. What happened was they were going to take this 65 hours and um, make a two hour documentary for theaters, for cinemas. And because Blood, Sweat and Tears was as big as you could get. And somehow that doc never got made, never got finished and never got released. And then somebody had the notion, let's cut a 60 minute version for television. And that's what these prints were, but that never got released either. So they've just been sitting in this vault since 1971. And so if we hadn't found those, we couldn't have made this doc, but we did. And as hopefully some of your audience will discover when they see the film is that it really is the foundation of our documentary. And it really takes us behind the scenes on this tour in a way that uh, if we hadn't found it, uh, the story could not have been told. Right. And, and what was so many, first of all, you can do a documentary about the making of this documentary. <laughs> 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 absolutely. <laughs> because yeah, you went absolutely. Through, I mean, really, it's kind of going down the rabbit hole. You <laughs> kept going down different rabbit holes. It is. Holes. And I'll share another story with you. We knew that they had taken uh, an eight track tape machine with them on the tour. Not the kind people used to have in their cars, but it was a portable eight track studio machine. And they recorded all of their concerts. Where are those? Mm -hmm. And in this 60 minute film that we found were numerous performances by the band on stage. But um, this was 16 millimeter film and the sound is on this little strip on the side of the film. It's compressed and it's mono. We could have mono sound. We could have lived with that. But I am really persistent. And uh, your friend and mine, Kathleen Ermitage, went on the hunt for these tapes. And she tracked down uh, the family of the associate producer of this documentary that never got released. He had died in 2018, but his family had donated all of uh, the contents of his storage unit to the Academy of Motion Picture Arts and Sciences Library here in Beverly Hills. And it had just been sitting there for three years, four years. Um, they, they didn't know what was in the collection. They hadn't inventoried it. So Kathleen, as you may remember, is very sweet, uh, but extraordinarily persistent. And she got this great archivist to um, finally inventory the collection. And amazingly, there were five of these eight track tapes there. We know that there were 18 originally because we got three, four, seven, eight and 18. Where the other tapes are, we don't know. Why he saved these five, we don't know. But happily he did. And so... Bobby Columbi, uh, the leader of the band, and Alan Sides, a great uh, musician who used to live up near you in Santa Barbara. Um, we all went into Capitol Records, uh, the famous studio where Frank Sinatra used to record all of his stuff. And Bobby and Alan mixed this stuff. And for people who come to see the movie, this, this music is going to be in your face. Yeah. It sounds like it was recorded just yesterday. And this band is so good. And Blasting out of movie theater speakers is just going to be a real thrill. Oh, I can't. I, I mean, I obviously I saw it at home, but I'm really looking forward to seeing it in the movie theater. It, uh, I mean, it's an earworm. All, I, I, I'm, I mean, all of their songs keep playing in my head over and over and over again. And they uh, will. They just will. Yeah. I mean, you know, I hate to date myself, but I do remember them. <laughs> <laughs> So, um, and you too, you know, you kind of do wonder what, I mean, they won album of the year what, in 1970 and they beat out the Beatles, Abbey Road. Who, who were the other ones? Because they were all amazing that year. There was the first Crosby, Stills and Nash record. There was Johnny Cash at San Quentin wow. live album. And there was uh, an album by the Fifth Dimension who were very popular at that yeah. time, popular vocal group. And, um, it's just, that's how good these guys were, you yes. know? Um, it was really interesting. I, I, I was uh, having dinner at a restaurant here in LA um, one night and my my der my dermatologist was at a couple of tables over, I noticed. And so I went over to say hello and he was there with a young couple. And he said, oh, you know, John's a great documentarian. And they said, well, what are you working on? And I said, well, I'm doing this film that involves blood, sweat and tears. You know, it's just like total blank look. They, right. they were in their maybe early thirties. They had not heard of this band, but 
then I started to say, oh, well, you know, they did Spinning Wheel and you made me so very happy. And, and when I died, oh yeah, oh yeah, oh yeah. They knew the music from listening to the radio, um, but they were just more fascinated about what was the story. And I think most people will be because it's just an unusual, unusual story. It is, it just kind of blows you away. So they are at the height of their career. It's 1970, the country's in turmoil. We, you know, we're, we have all the, you know, marches against the war. We've got the yippies with Abby Hoffman, which you also feature in this film. And um, and then we have this wonderful band, Blood, Sweat, and Tears, and they are on, on their pinnacle. And they are asked by the State Department, uh, at the time president, it was President Nixon and Kissinger, uh, Secretary of State Kissinger, and they're asked to go behind the Iron Curtain. One of the first, I think first, I don't know if the other bands went after that, Very to go first. to uh, Yugoslavia, Romania, and Czechoslovakia, right? Those that was the- Poland. Poland, Poland. Okay. So let's talk about that because that's what changed their whole career. I mean, here they are. I mean, they have this unique sound with, you know, horns and every, I mean, it was just an amazing band. It really was. And, and you didn't, again, didn't even think about what may have happened to him. So that's because this whole thing is a, a political thriller. It is just fascinating just in fact yeah. it's one of the most fascinating documentaries i've seen and i mean i see a lot of documentaries and i love documentaries but this one truly was that had so much to it that you wouldn't expect at all aren't you nice thank you um the world in 1970 was polarized in many ways like the world is today and in fact i think that's one of the things that people will find when they see Uh, what the hell happened to blood sweat and tears is that it was polarized between east and west so back then it was russia versus the united states and there were these satellite countries that were aligned with russia uh, and uh, we describe it in the film there was this sort of line in eastern europe and uh, to the east was behind the iron curtain those were all the countries affiliated with russia and to the uh, west of those were all the, you know, Fran- uh, France, Germany, Italy, all the Western countries that were aligned with the United States. And the U.S. government, oh, sorry, and we should also say here today, we are aligned East versus West. It's Putin and his gangsters versus the rest of the Western world in Ukraine. So mm-hmm. very relevant still. Right. Um, but back then, Nixon wanted to establish relationships with these three countries, Yugoslavia, Romania, and Poland, because their leaders were somewhat independent and had been trying in their own small way to break away a little bit out of the Soviet orbit. And one of the ways they felt uh, this uh, relation, these relationships could be built was through cultural exchanges, sending over uh, ballet uh, companies, theater companies, classical musicians, jazz musicians, And then through a very strange set of circumstances that we detail in the film, now the State Department gets a chance to send one of the hottest bands in the world uh, behind the Iron Curtain to further American democracy and spread the the message of freedom uh, to these countries that are basically uh, 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 under authoritarian regimes. And the tour itself went reasonably well, except in Bucharest, Romania, where there was a near riot because the kids were enjoying the music so much and the government couldn't handle that. And what they did we uh, to these kids, we show in the film. Um, but it's what happened when Blood, Sweat and Tears came back to America that really affected their trajectory. And the country then was as polarized politically, right and left, as we are today, right and left. Mm-hmm. And today, I mean, people will will realize that you get if you're in a political conversation and people are criticizing you, it's either from the right or the left. Right. Blood, sweat, and tears comes back to America, and they get it from the right and the left. They're in this squeeze by both sides, which was a uh, incredibly unique situation to be in, and it's that situation that uh, fostered the uh, what happened to them in terms of affecting. Um, their hipness, their credibility, their legitimacy, and ultimately the fan base that sort of trailed away in, in, in some way. 
which was just sad, you know, uh, that that even happened to them because they didn't really want to go on this tour. Right. We can't, I don't want to say too much because right. I want your, want right. your uh, audience to, to go to see the film, but yes. Lord yeah. Blackmail figures yes. very prominently in our film and the band had to go on this tour. So uh, what what is very sort of Shakespearean tragedy here is uh, a group of young guys did what they thought would save their career and it ended up killing it. And that's a very Shakespearean kind of story. It is. I was surprised when I read that they're still touring, that they never really stop. They never really stop. What, you know, it's interesting, Jan, what happens is, and you see it with movies, with TV shows, with, with musicians, uh, the word we use today is zeitgeist. That mm -hmm. word wasn't around back then, but it's you capture something. You have a moment mm -hmm. where everything seems to be going right and you get great press and people are coming to your shows and you get great reviews on your concerts and your albums and all. And everything is just kind of building up. And that's where Blood, Sweat and Tears was. But that moment can be so fleeting. And if even one element goes off, somehow it can affect everything. And that's really what happened to the band. So they didn't break up, but what it did was cause the band to fracture. It exacerbated the conflicts that were, were sort of under the surface between the band members. And then, by, you know, uh, uh, 18 months later, David Clayton Thomas, the lead singer, leaves. Um, the two arrangers, Dick Halligan and Fred Lipsius, leave. The year after that, Steve Katz, the guitarist, and uh, Lou Soloff, the trumpet uh, player, they leave. Uh, so Bobby Columbi, the band leader, uh, sort of uh, valiantly um, uh, kept everything going until about 1976. And then he left. And what happened then was David Clayton Thomas licensed the name Blood, Sweat and Tears. And he toured with a band until about 2004 uh, uh, with that name, none of the original musicians. And then um, ever since 2004, there is a Blood, Sweat and Tears out there touring and they do uh, performing arts centers, they do uh, uh, jazz clubs, uh, they do casino theaters, uh, but they've been out there ever since playing um, uh, the Blood, Sweat and Tears music and then some other songs in the style of. Yeah. And, if, if, and yeah. sorry, one more thing. Uh, um, for this film, all the dramatic moments in the film, I wanted an original score. I didn't want to use, you know, pre-recorded canned music. So I went to uh, Bobby Columbia and I said, so I want you to to, to compose this score. And he said, oh no, I, I, don't, I, I can't, do, I don't want to do that. And it took me like a month. He said, no, 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 I don't want to do that. Finally, I persuaded him and he, and uh, with a very talented New York musician named David Mann, the two of them composed uh, all the music that you hear in the dramatic story uh, uh, sequences. Uh, and we had the current Blood, Sweat and Tears play it. So there's this sort of, sort of full circle thing here. It is, and I was gonna ask you, is there, uh, is there going to be a CD? from this film? Yes, great question, thank you. Yes, Omnivore Recordings, uh, one of the great independent labels is putting out uh, two versions of the soundtrack. We have all the live recordings that we talked about that Kathleen found and uh, Bobby and uh, Alan Sides mixed and those are on a CD. So in essence, it's a live Blood, Sweat and Tears album that no one has ever heard the individual tracks. But then all the uh, original score that uh, Bobby and David did um, will be available digitally on uh, all of the regular platforms. So you can buy a CD, you can you can buy it digitally, and uh, uh, we didn't get started uh, soon enough, but there'll be a vinyl version of the live Blood, Sweat and Tears tracks later in the year. Wonderful, wonderful. Oh, I, I, I definitely want to get in line to buy that. For <laughs> Thank, sure. you. Thank you. <laughs> for sure, because I, I, you know, I loved it. How yeah. difficult. I mean, you, I mean, you've got, I mean, you, you have a lot of the original members. I think you have all of them that are still alive. Is that right? Or were there some that refused to not be? There were two that felt they didn't have much to offer. Okay. And so we didn't do interviews with them, but we did do interviews with the other five and two have, have died, um, unfortunately. Uh, and, and so obviously we weren't able to, to work with them, but, uh, uh, the great trumpet player, Lou Soloff, had passed away some years ago, but we got in touch with his daughters and they had a storage unit. They didn't know what was in it. 
So Kathleen again goes down to, to Albuquerque and uh, checks into this thing. And what we found were dozens of photos from this tour that were very helpful to us in terms of telling the story. So we're very thankful to the Soloff daughters for that. Amazing. As I said, this is, it was like a lot of magical mystery tour that you went on. Let's talk about Don uh, Camburn. Uh, yes. Because, yeah, let's just talk because he went on to have an amazing career. Amazing career. So let's talk a little bit about him because he was the person who was filming this, was on the That's tour correct. to film this whole, uh, the, you know, the, the tour itself. So let's talk about that because he's the one who did the 65 hours of. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> thanks for asking. Uh, the nicest man. Um, he was a top editor in the business at this time. He had done five easy pieces and would go on to do Romancing the Stone and a lot of other great, great movies. Yes. And this was going to be his first directing job. And so he supervised the uh, uh, camera crew of five uh, on this Blood, Sweat and Tears Iron Curtain tour. And uh, as I said, shot the 65 hours and came back and Don started to work on the edit. And that's when the problems started. And what you see in the film is uh, uh, in these interviews with Don is his real grief and sadness almost that this ch child, if you will, of his, this film um, never came out and, and, and why it didn't um, uh, we talk about. And, um, but Don, it was really interesting. I, you know, his name was there, but, uh, and I certainly knew who, who he was, but it took us a long time to find him. He was 90 years old. He had been living in a, a assisted living facility in Burbank, California. And we finally tracked him down, but this was COVID time. Mm. And um, as many of your uh, audience may know, uh, these kinds of facilities wouldn't let people in or out because they wanted to protect the health of the older residents. So we wanted to interview Don for the longest time and he had a story to tell, mm -hmm. um, but we couldn't get him. And then finally in um, late to 21, early 22, uh, when we were deep into production on this documentary, he finally, there's, a, there's like a week or 10 days where he's able to come out. So it was like, Come on, Don. So we, we got him to our uh, our offices and we did this interview and, and you've seen it. He's amazing in this interview. His emotion is right up front and you really feel all of this and how we felt about it. And and great recall for a guy who, you know, 90, 91 years old. And the sad thing is Don never got to see our documentary. They were locked up again and then he started to have some health issues and he wasn't really able to, to get out. And then he passed away about a month ago. Oh. And so he never had a chance to see it. Um, but his uh, his son, um, who I've been in touch with, is going to see it when it plays in Hawaii in theaters. And his 80-some-year-old his girlfriend, uh, Barbara, is going to come and see it uh, here in L.A. when we get into theaters as well. Um, but but he, he's a great storyteller. And I think that's what I always try to do in my docs is just to have a a range of different kinds of voices, if you will, people who have a different perspective on things and, and it's the way that they speak. And here Don had a uh, recall because he was seeing things even the band members didn't see. And, and then you got on top of that, you get the emotional way in which he speaks. And uh, it just made for a great interview and really elevated the film once we were able to put him in. Oh, I, you know, I totally agree. I mean, it was, it, it, yeah, it, I totally agree. He, he, he did. He brought a lot of the emotion and how he felt about this. It was very difficult for him, you know, to not have this film come out the way he wanted it to. I mean, I don't want to give too much away either, John, because there's so much to this to this film, to this documentary. That's it's truly amazing. I do want to talk a little bit about David Clayton Thomas because I just adore him. And, um, you know, was a again, difficult to get these band members together to want to talk about this? Or was there hard feelings? How did they all feel about being a part of this project? Um, they are kind of scattered around. Um, Bobby's in California. David is in Toronto. Steve Katz is in Connecticut. Uh, Fred Lipsius is uh, just outside of Boston. And Jim Fielder is down in North Carolina. So there wasn't a chance really to get everybody together to talk about it. But honestly, 
I think it was one of the easiest things to do was to get these guys to agree. I think they have been nurturing their feelings about what happened to them for decades. And this was a chance for them to tell their story. And I think they were all very excited about doing it. They all had different perspectives. It's a bit like the Rashomon thing where you can have, you know, five people on, on street corners and they see an ac a traffic accident, but they all saw different things. And only by talking to all of them can you piece things together. And that's kind of what happened here is that um, they all kind of had their little moments that they witnessed. And it was me having to put together and be able to corroborate their memories uh, and then decide what to, to keep in the film uh, or not. But I would say in general, there was a, a, a sense of sadness mm -hmm. and some anger about what happened to them. Um, not so much regret, I think, because they had to do this tour. Um, but I think sadness and anger in, in, in some measure for both of them. Um, David, um, I, I had never uh, talked to him before I went up to Toronto to interview him. We were just uh, uh, communicating by email. And uh, as you saw, I mean, he's great in this film. He's, he is thoughtful and smart and articulate and interesting to hear. And his perspective on what happened is, is very uh, compelling. And so uh, we just had the best time with him. And, um, uh, and so that was great. Uh, the other guys, uh, all the same thing, very different personalities. Uh, and that comes across in the film. And I like that because yeah. you don't want them all to be the same and to, to talk and, and, and remember exactly all the same things. Oh, John, I could talk to you more about this movie because there's so much to it and so many wonderful layers to it. But we have to go. But before we do go, uh, let's let our audience know where they can watch uh, what the hell happened to blood, sweat, tears? <laughs> Thank you, Jan. I appreciate that. We are opening in, uh, in, in, in theaters in New York City uh, on March 24th. Uh, we open in Los Angeles on March 31st, and we'll run in theaters a, a week each place there. And now we're in 50 other theaters across the country in and around that time. So uh, if your viewers will go to our website, which is bstdoc, D-O-C, bstdoc.com and on the uh, uh, landing page on the upper right you'll see watch and if you click on that it lists all the theaters across the country where the film will be playing and also the opportunity to uh, to buy tickets uh, i am so proud of this film and i really want people to come and see it on a big screen with uh, all that great sound coming out at you um, and hopefully it'll be coming to a theater near you we're adding new theaters every day and so the website gets uh, updated every day Great. Thank you so much, John. It's a pleasure to have you back on the show, and I look forward to having you on with your next project. I look um, forward to it, Jan. Thanks for having me. Too. Thank you. Take Thanks. care. Have a great day. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Okay.